you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. This may probably be one of the strangest messages you've ever heard. It's a bit different today. And I want to caution you to please refrain from trying to build a doctrine or a theology on any little portion of Scripture I may use this morning because I'm going to use several passages of Scripture. But I want you to understand I'm not pre preaching a theology. I'm not preaching a doctrine. I'm not even preaching on one particular sin over another. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a principle. But it's a principle that I think if we get it, and we apply it to our lives, I believe it will change our lives, thereby change our church, thereby change our community, and so on and so forth. Isaiah 61, verse number 10, Isaiah writes and says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation. He's draped me in a robe of righteousness. I'm like a bridegroom in his wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. Notice it says, God has dressed me. God has dressed me. The bride has her clothes. The groom has his clothes. Each one has their appropriate attire. But su suppose that the bride comes walking down the aisle wearing a tux. Not unheard of. Only to find the groom standing at the altar in his wedding dress. Still not out of the question these days. Believe it or not, we have a name for this. We call it cross-dressing. And today, I guess the politically correct term is transgender. One definition of transgender is a person who derives pleasure from dressing in clothes appropriate to the opposite sex. Now, what may shock you a little bit is the title of my message this morning because it's cross-dressing Christians. I want to talk about cross-dressing Christians. Now, you can breathe because it's probably not going to be exactly what you think. I remember when my youngest daughter was about six years old and I was watching something on the news and, and I just shook my head. I said, what is this world coming to? And she looked at me and she said, an end. Daddy, it's coming to an end. And I thought out of the mouth of babes because this thing has got to be winding down. I'm gonna share some scripture with you this morning and uh, some of them may challenge your beliefs. Some of, them may, some of them may make you mad. Some of them may seem taboo. Some of them are scriptures on which preachers fear to tread. I just believe that if it's in the Bible, we don't have to be afraid of it. So let's just jump in with both feet and let's see what the Bible says about a few issues. Turn to Romans chapter one. If you know anything about the Bible and you know anything about Romans chapter one, you're probably saying, no, he didn't. But he did. Um, guys on video, I think I've got this started to start at verse eight, but for time's sake, let's jump on to verse 16. We're going to begin with verse 16, Romans one. He says, I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from the start to the finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because God's made it obvious to them. Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. 
As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Pay close attention to verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them. He abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with other other women. The men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men as a result of this sin. They suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and he let them do things that should never be done. Here's what happened. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, Hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent. They're proud and they're boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. In fact, they strongly suggest that others do them also. Pretty strong stuff, huh? I've heard a lot of preachers preach out of Romans chapter one. I've heard a lot of non-preachers talk about Romans chapter one, at least part of it. I'm almost positive that every sermon I've ever heard preached from this chapter, every conversation I've listened to concerning this chapter has dealt with one subject, one subject only. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Come on. It's not a rhetorical question. Try it. Who said it? Thank you. Say it a little louder. Thank you. We may as well say it. Why not? That's certainly the juiciest verse in this chapter. It's certainly the easiest target to shoot at. What I find a little bit strange is I've never heard anyone preach out of Romans chapter one on the sin of gossip. Never. 30 years of pastoring and 50 years of going to church. I've never heard anyone preach out of Romans chapter one on envy or greed or strife or deceit or malice or disobeying your parents. I've never, I've never heard it come out of here. Yet here it is. Here it is. Verse 28, they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. They abandoned him to their foolish thinking. He let them do whatever things that should never be done. Their lives became full of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They break their promises. They're heartless, and they have no mercy. I've never heard any of that preached. Never, not out of Romans chapter one. And I just find that strange. I just find that strange. Now, let me stop right here and say that I'm not here this morning to condone or to condemn any sin over another sin, including my own. 
But what I'm curious about is why is it so easy for us to preach on the, for example, evils of homosexuality or abortion or gambling or smoking or drinking or a few others that are really easy, really big targets and skip right over gossiping and disrespecting our parents and pride and greed. How is it we can pick these out? How do we do that? Do you know the most popular sin to preach about and protest against today? Anybody know? The most popular sin to preach about, the most popular sin to talk about is other people's. Other people's. I told you last week, never once have I seen anybody walking around their front yard with a picket sign saying sinners live here. But guess what? Sinners live there. I have never known one businessman to boycott his business because sinners run that business. Never. But it's easy for us to talk about other people's sin. It's easy for us to do that. There are men who dress up like women, and there are women who dress up like men. We call it cross-dressing. The implication in the Bible is clear. Men should wear men's clothes. Women, men should do men things. Men have certain responsibilities given to us, not by the laws of the state, given to us by God. God mandated things for men. Women should dress and act and talk and conduct themselves like women. God has given women certain responsibilities. It's not my opinion other than the fact I, I, my opinion is to believe the Bible, I'm just reading here. So let me read a couple. Let's just, let's just see what, I mean, if you want to debate whether the Bible is true or not, you can do that. But if you do believe that, then let's just read the Bible. So if it offends you, let the Bible offend you. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse one, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, give thanks for them. Pray for, pray this way, for kings and all those in authority so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there's only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time, and I've been chosen as a preacher and an apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just telling the truth. Amen. I'm just telling the truth. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up, free from anger and controversy. I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing, not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or wearing gold or pearls and inexpensive clothes. I wish you had wear inexpensive clothes. Expensive clothes. For women claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. Now, you've heard and I've heard these verses misused and misquoted a lot of times, and that's a tragedy, but it's the truth. But it says instruction to women, how to dress modestly, how to behave appropriately. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick. Let me get to the men. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because it'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. Make music to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. 
For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church, a church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church and we're members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife and the two of them are one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, so let's cut to the chase. What's this message all about anyway? If you go back and look at, let's say, verse 22, he says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay, who's the Apostle Paul addressing here? Say it again. Wives. Don't be scared to answer. It says it right here, wives. He's addressing wives. Can I ask you a question? Who do we hear quoting this verse mostly? Submit. Submit. You submit to me. That's what the Bible says. Wives, submit to your husbands. Line up, girl. We'll get tattoos. Say, submit. Submit. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what the Bible says. Men, did you know when you do that? You are spiritually cross-dressing. You're clothing yourselves in scripture that was not written to you. It didn't say, husbands, tell your wives to submit. Didn't mention you. Didn't say anything about, it wasn't written to husbands, it was written to wives. You got one. Husbands. This means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Husbands, who's it written to? Husbands, wives, quit quoting it to your husbands. Quit taping it to the dashboard of his car and on his bathroom mirror. You're supposed to love me like Christ loves the church. It's not written to you, it's written to husbands. You're spiritually cross-dressing. I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach this in the right context and preach this, but when you use these verses as ammunition in your arsenal, you are Christian cross-dressing. You are spiritually taking on garments that were never meant to you. My concern today is that the church has gotten grossly entangled in the sin of spiritual cross-dressing. In other words, we tend to preach and teach and memorize and quote all of the verses that are not written to us or designed for us, but they relate to others. We wear it like we're wearing a new suit of clothes, quoting it every chance we get. Parents love to quote the children, the, the, the verses. Children, obey your parents, what the Bible says. Honor your father and your mother. That's great. One problem, it wasn't written to you, parents. It was written to children. It didn't say, parents, you know, it, it, it was written to children. I'm not saying we shouldn't teach this to our children or we shouldn't preach this or teach the whole Bible. What I'm saying is let's be careful that we don't clothe ourselves in only the scriptures that benefit us. That's what I'm saying. Let's not take on the scriptures that we like, that we can use as a hammer to beat somebody else up while we're ignoring the scriptures that's written to us. So here's the real problem with this, cross-dressing Christianity. When we spend all of our time trying on everybody else's clothes, reading and quoting and memorizing what God's saying to everybody else, my question is, what are you missing that God's trying to say to you? You're walking around spiritually naked. Where are your clothes? Some, some of you know exactly where to find scriptures on homosexuality, but you can't take me two places to show me scriptures on gossip or disobeying your parents or not judging others. You're walking around in your wife's shoes and, and your kids' clothes and your neighbor's shirt and your friend's hat and your enemy's coats, and you got on all these garments. None of them belong to you. Where is the garments that God's wanting to dress you in? 
Where is the robe of righteousness God's wanting to wrap you in? Where's the armor of God that he's wanting to, where is your breastplate of righteousness and your helmet of salvation and your feet shot about with the preparation of the God? Man, you're walking around in high heels. He's wanting you to put on our work boots. We're walking around trying to take care of everybody else's sin, but the sin we want to talk about is everybody else's. Whose clothes have you been walking in? What scriptures have you spent your time memorizing? Not to grow up in Christ, that's one thing, but you're memorizing them to defend your precious doctrine and theology so you can use to defend your position and keep others in their place. Are these really the scriptures God's wanting to speak to you? God spoke this to my heart so clear that said the enemy is robbing us blind by distracting us with verses that everybody else needs while we ignore the scriptures that we need. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans that are good and not of evil that you may have a hope and a future. Quit worrying about everybody else. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for your life. And church, it doesn't matter if this world goes to hell in a handbasket. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I have a home in heaven. I've got some scripture God's promised me. And it doesn't matter what the world does and everybody else does. I need to focus on what God wants to say to me. Now, let me just close with giving you a couple of one size fits all. These are unisex scriptures. Okay. They fit everybody. They don't belong to just men, women, husband, wives, parents, or children. They're, They're transgender scriptures. One guy asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is you love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second greatest commandment, by the way, is that you love your neighbor as yourself. That fits everybody. That fits everybody. He said, on these two commandments, you can hang all the law. Everything else will fit under these two. Here's another one. He said, judge not so you won't be judged. With whatever measure you judge others, that's how you're going to be judged. Oh, that fits. That fits good. Men, women, boys, girls. Oh, here's one more. Forgive one another's sins. Because if you forgive other sins, your heavenly Father will forgive your sins. But if you don't forgive other sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins in this world or the world to come. That fits like a glove to everybody. One size fits all. I wonder how many of us this morning would be willing to just come out of the closet. Say, if you had told me, Pastor... 30 minutes ago that I was a cross-dresser, I'd have thought you was crazy. But I realized something this morning. I've been spiritually cross-dressing. I've been taking scriptures that weren't even written to me, but I've been using them as a club to beat somebody else up. I've been interested in talking about everybody's sins but mine. I've I've been guilty of examining everybody's life but mine. I've been trying to fix everybody's problems but mine. We've clothed ourselves in scriptures that really don't even pertain to us. You see, when I stand before God, I won't have to give an account for how my wife acted. She's not going to have to give an account for how I behaved. I'm not going to answer to God for how my friends lived or my enemies. When I stand before God, I'm going to have to give an account for my garment. He said, I'm looking looking for a garment without spot or without wrinkle. Church, we, we need to be careful. We don't go around trying to press everybody else's clothes and ours look like they just come out of the washing machine. He said, I'm looking for a garment without spot or without wrinkle. Pay attention to the scriptures I'm writing to you. Listen to what I'm wanting to say to you. Jesus said it like this. Stop trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own eye. We're so worried about trying to get our wives to submit or our husbands to love us or our children to straighten up and live right. We want to tell everybody else how they should live. They're not living right. They're living in sin. 
They're disobeying the Bible. They're being disobedient. Well, you're cross-dressing. You're a spiritual transgender, one who takes pleasure in dressing in someone else's clothes. And you may be gossiping about it. And you may be proud because you're not this. You may have malice or jealousy or unforgiveness, and you may be judging others. What if, what if we could just stop it? What if we just dropped our rocks? What if? What if? What kind of church would this church be? What kind of believers would we be if we could just drop our rocks and pray with the psalmist, search my heart, O God? And know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. I've taught you before, the word wicked, we like to say, well, I'm not wicked. The word wicked comes from the root word wick, which means to twist. If you see a candle wick, it's a piece of twisted string. If you see wicker furniture, it's wood that's been twisted. And sometimes we stand in danger, I think, of getting so twisted. We take something the Bible says and we twist it. And we twist it to fit our needs and to fit our lifestyle. And the sin we want to talk about is everybody else's sin. What they're doing out there. Because I'll be honest with you, if, I can, if I'm here and I can look out there and I can see that they're here, I don't feel so bad about being here. But God says you're judging your life using the wrong standard. We don't judge our lives by their standard. We judge our lives by his standard. His standard's way up there somewhere. And I judge it not by, because I can be way up there somewhere, but I judge it through the blood of Jesus Christ that says I'm way up there. If you're way up there, I'm way up there. If your blood is still strong, then I'm standing there because God sees us through the eyes of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's take God's word to us. Let's say this morning, God, if you're wanting to speak to me about my life, show me what I can do. Show me how I can love my wife. Show me how I can love my husband. Show me how I can love my friends. Show me how I can love my enemies. Show me, God, what you want me to be. Because when I stand before you, I want to stand before you without spot or wrinkle. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.